So I've prepared this short presentation just to make sure that my students have a common understanding of the fundamental concepts involved in programming a computer. So when we think about how we're going to communicate to the computer to get it to do things, we have to recognize that all of us have a natural language in which we can communicate. And this is no different for computers. Computers uh, speak uh, in, a, in a specific way that is really kind of hard for us as humans to get our heads around because we are capable of abstract thought. We're capable of making leaps within our brains that computers just can't do, at least not yet. What we need to understand is how the computer uh, can understand the things that we want to tell it to do. Languages have both structure and syntax. These are the rules by which the interpreter or the compiler parses our code and translates it into something that the computer can actually work with. So one of the languages that's closest to uh, what the machine can understand is called assembly language. Generally, assembly language is specific to a processor and contains all of the commands that a computer can actually understand. Generally, each line has uh, just a few parts that line up with the way that it expects to parse out this command and turn it into instructions that the computer can understand. And it's really hard for us to get our heads around. I teach assembly language programming, and it's probably the harder one because we have to break things down into these really simple steps, and we're just not good at that as humans. Not only do we prefer to write in languages that are similar to how we work in human uh, speech, uh, we also like to structure our code like we do in human communication. We've adapted languages to be more like the way that we speak. Um, so there are lots of similarities between writing good code and writing a great essay. And I mark a lot of essays, so I've thought about this quite a bit. So what are the parts of an essay? Well, every essay has some sort of title to identify it or differentiate it from other essays. Every good essay has a beginning and an end. Usually we call that an introduction uh, and a conclusion. So the introduction establishes what you're going to talk about and the conclusion, you tell the reader what you did in your paper. And in between, you have a series of arguments and propositions. I actually tell my undergrad students at the university their job is not to have opinions, but to make claims and to back them up. But every essay has a sort of rhetoric all its own. Some are informative, like historical essays. Some are directive, like practical essays. Um, some are logical, trying to work on if an idea is actually functional. At this point, you might be imagining some correlates with computer programming. Typically, at the end of an essay, you'll have a, a, a number of references, a, a bibliography. These can also be inline as citation marks and footnotes. Wherever they are, notes like this establish where you drew your arguments from when you were writing your essay. The big difference is that for most computer languages, you begin with the bibliography. These are the resources you will draw from. But for the sake of my argument, I'll talk about these last. So every program has some sort of name. Often it is a file name or the name of the main class you are working with. I will use the example from C language throughout this presentation, just because most languages today are based in some way on C. Think of the language as having structure and syntax, and the syntax is the vocabulary of commands, and the structure is how we put those arguments together. It needs to have a coherent, logical flow. The way you put commands together also has to have a, a logical, coherent flow. The structure has a directional quality to it. You move through a series of steps. Therefore, the program has a beginning and an end. And usually think of these things as the curly brackets that delimit a bit of code. But we could also compare the opening uh, to the variable declarations as those things you are going to be working with in your program, and the output as the end or the uh, conclusion. So often in, in uh, C, we have uh, something that's returned to the whatever environment called it, which could be the operating system. We can also, as a good programming practice, think of the introduction as the opening comments where you describe what it is that your program is going to do. Of course, within the body of the program, there are arguments and propositions, really logical sets of instructions that lead us from the introduction to the conclusion. Rather than rhetoric, because we are not arguing with the computer, we use algorithms to structure our sets of instructions to accomplish logical tasks. And generally, we have an overall algorithm 
which we might articulate in the introductory comments. But each part of the code, much like individual paragraphs, has its own logic and algorithm. In fact, in programming languages, we often break up those up into individual reusable functions or procedures, but we'll get into that more later. And finally, there are our references. In C, we put those at the beginning of our file as uh, include statements so that we can borrow functions and procedures from libraries. Just like a real well-formed footnote, the include lets the compiler or interpreter know exactly where to find the logic that it wants to use. So let's turn now to some of the inner logic of the computer program. Let's start with variables. So variables are holders for different kinds of data. This is the data that we will primarily be working with in our programs. Computer programs take data from various sources and use that data to accomplish an amazing array of different tasks, limited almost only by one's imagination. So at, at their core, variables are references to locations in memory that hold different kinds of data. If you remember what a computer does, it stores ones and zeros in transistors. Variables group together collections of these bits into something more meaningful. For example, a group of eight bits is also known as a byte. Some variable types consist of a single byte, others two or more bytes. We use types to identify how we can parse or understand the contents of a variable. Every computer language has what are called primitive types, meaning a collection of basic types that include both the size of memory that a variable takes up and the logic by which we can interpret the collection of ones and zeros in those bits. So the usual suspects here are the, the, the car, or C-H-A-R, which is usually a single byte meant to represent a single ASCII character. Integers of varying length are called short, int, and long in C, and floating point numbers, which hold a sort of scientific notation uh, that represents numbers uh, with a floating decimal place. Those include float and double in C, where double holds double the precision of the regular float. In order to make primitives more useful, we often gather them together into structures and arrays. Structures can have multiple different types of variables, and arrays are ways of storing a sequence of one type of variable, or even of structures. Probably the most common array you will encounter is called the string, and it consists of a sequence of characters, ASCII characters. Just to complicate things a wee bit, you can have a structure that includes arrays, and you can also have an array of structures. The thing to remember is that in all cases, we are talking about an allocation of memory and the logic needed to interpret or parse the bits of data in that memory. And there's also another way we can organize data where we couple it with the functions or methods that work on that data. We call this an object, and really this is the cornerstone of object-oriented programming. And we'll cover that a little bit later in our presentation. It is important to note that when we create a variable, uh, we give a name to the location where that variable is stored. Many languages are case sensitive in terms of variable names, so it's important to take care in how we name variables. Variable uh, names should be reasonable, meaning that they should be descriptive of what they do. So the variable i, for example, is often used in loops to count iterations. So i uh, is for iteration. As a programmer, you will adopt your own distinct naming schema. But in an enterprise project, there may be established schemas that everyone has to adhere to for consistency's sake. One more aspect of variables I want to mention is the notion that some languages, like C, are loosely typed, and some, like Java, are strongly typed. In C, you use the type to interpret the bits starting from the first bit's memory location. So if you want to interpret an int as a, a, a car, you can do that. I'm, you might not like the results, but you can do that. In Java, the type follows the variable around, and I need to use an explicit conversion to see a variable in a different type. Finally, I need to say that variables have scope. Where we declare or set up the variable is important. Variables can be global in context, meaning that we can see it from anywhere in the program. And C, we declare global variables outside of the main body of the program. 
We also have local variables that are accessible only in the context where they reside. So a function uh, can have its own variables and it can pass the data or sometimes the memory addresses for the data to the various local contexts. So variables are memory locations that hold useful collections of ones and zeros. In order to execute logic on our various data, we need to have a logical or coherent way to move through the data, um, move that data through various operations. At a machine level, we call these operations logic gates. String enough logic gates together and you can perform mathematical operations. You can follow decision trees and even facilitate machine learning. I like the image of a flow chart uh, to give the basic representation of what I mean by program flow. Most of us are familiar with a flow chart as a graphical representation of the flow of data through a program. The one thing that we need to understand about all computer programs is that they are essentially sequential in nature. So my first computer programming language was Commodore BASIC, which used even used line numbers to denote the sequential nature of the code. The computer program steps through the lines of code one at a time. Now, we can jump around in the code. In fact, in BASIC, we would jump around using go-to statements. Go to line 130, for example, which would pass control to line 130 of the code and continue to work sequentially from there at least until we encountered some other sort of branching. I want to spend a bit more time looking at three common flow constructs. Conditional branching, where the code calls for a decision to be made, which will determine what is the next operation to be executed. Uh, looping, where I have a set of operations that we want to repeat until a condition is reached. And procedures, which allow us to group operations that we might want to call on at different points in our programs. So let's start with logical branching. One of the most basic forms uh, of program flow control is what we call logical or conditional branching. The classic form of this is the if then else statement. If something is true, then do something, uh, then do something else, do this other thing. In C, we use an if with a test and then either a single line of code or a group of operations de delimited by a, a squiggly brackets. If we want an explicit alternative, uh, meaning something that only happens if the condition fails, then we add an else clause to our if statement. The test condition involves some sort of relational or logical comparison. For example, if x is greater than y, then do these operations. Or if y is equal to 4 and color is blue, then do these operations. There are two things that I want you to notice about this kind of statement. First, the condition is always evaluated into a Boolean state, meaning it is either true or false. This means that I can nest conditional branch statements together to create fairly complex logic, but the basis is always a simple true or false. The second thing to notice is that I will take care to use brackets around expressions because all operators have an order of precedence and languages sometimes vary on this so it's something to pay attention to. If you remember my basic premise that a computer only ever does what you tell it to do, here is where the computer can misunderstand our intentions. What we need to know are the rules of its language to communicate effectively with a computer because a computer follows those rules strictly. I just want to mention two special cases in terms of conditional branching. The first is a switch. A switch is sometimes called a case statement. It is a clean way to code a nested set of conditional branches where we are testing a common expression against a set of possible results. So think about a menu where I can choose from several options. The switch is a clean way to depict those options. The second is exception handling, where we can catch errors that might occur in the running of our program in order to um, have it behave in a clean and predictable manner. In Java, you'd be familiar with try and catch constructs. These essentially fire in if the condition of an error is reached. Another way that we can control the flow of our computer program is through looping constructs. Loops use some sort of test condition also with a Boolean result, to continue repeating a set of instructions until the code is no longer true. 
there are three basic kinds of loop in, loops in C. Pre-test fixed increment loops, pre-test loops, and post-test loops, known, also known as the for loop, the while loop, and the do while loop. Pre-test loops test for continuation at the top or the beginning of the loop. So if the condition fails, you will not even have a single iteration of the loop. Use these kinds of loops when you're not even sure if you want to execute the loop once. The most common kind of pretest loop is a for loop, which is a kind of loop you use when you know how many iterations you need to loop before you start. So in C, the for loop has three parts to its condition, an assignment, a conditional test, and an increment. When I'm reading from an array, I, I want to keep moving uh, the offset of the array along a fixed rate and stop when I run out of data. The for loop is a great candidate for this. The other kind of pretest loop is the while loop, which will loop until a condition is met. So if I'm opening a file and I want to read until we reach the end of the file, a while loop is a great choice, especially because the file could start out as being empty. But when I know I want to run at least one iteration of a loop, such as in a menu where I'm letting the user make choices until they choose to quit, then I need to test at the end of the loop. In C, the post-test loop construct is a do-while loop. Uh, this will always do at least one iteration of the loop. So far, uh, we've covered program flow through conditional branching, where you perform operations based on logical decisions and through looping sets of commands, which is really a conditional branch that jumps back to the test until the test fails or is false. Loops are a way of grouping sets of commands that are repeated. But sometimes you want to group sets of commands and call them at different times in the program. Maybe you want something to output my data, I want something to output my data, and maybe I want to have some code that converts data into another form. We call these procedures, uh, subroutines, or uh, as we do in C, functions. I like to think of it this way. Everyone has a friend with a truck, or some of you are that friend with a truck. And when your friends need to move, who do they call? Or when your friends find out uh, I know a bit about fixing computers, their most stops working, so who do they call? So a procedure or function is like a friend you call on to do a specific task, something they alone are really good at. And they will do that task, and then when they are done, they'll simply go away. No beer or pizza is required. Hopefully you do not treat your friends like functions. Uh, you provide them pizza. Remember from earlier on in this presentation, we talked about libraries that we can include in our programs. These libraries are collections of functions and structures that are already tested, so we can rely on them. Uh, one such library allows us to deal with strings easily, almost as if they are a primitive type. And finally, we can pass data into a function when we call on that function and we can return a value from a function when it is complete. So when we send data into a function, we need to be careful because languages deal with variables in different ways. This is because variables are really memory locations that hold data, and the overhead of duplicating large data, like an array or a string, is quite costly in terms of processing power. So in those cases, a function will be passed a reference to the variable that is in the calling environment. In the case of a simple or primitive variable types, it is just as fast to send the value uh, to the function. So that is what often happens. It's always good to take note of how your language does functions before assuming that they work a certain way. So one final thing to mention is the idea of methods. A method is a function that is associated explicitly with an object. These behave like any other functions, but they are part of what we call object-oriented programming. So let's talk about the differences between structured and object-oriented programming before we finish up with a few brief comments on best practices and debugging. When I started programming, uh, it was with line-numbered basic languages. These were fairly linear uh, in structure, and you could create functions with jump statements, but getting back to the calling environment often required some kind of tricky coding. This is a, a structure. 
the early languages were structured around operations, meaning that their primary focus was performing commands in the order that you gave them. As languages developed, so did the elegance of their structures. So procedural code was a vast improvement on the strictly numbered code of my early programming days. Despite the leap in elegance of procedural approaches to programming, these kinds of languages still treated the operations as the primary things that the programs did. The problem is, is that we usually do not think about sets of instructions in abstraction from the data to which those instructions work. We often bundle the operations or skills with the object those skills are focused on. So think about a book, for example. I need a few skills to be able to, to use a book. I need to be able to turn pages, to read the text, to mark where I left off, and even uh, to have a way to store the book so that I can get to it later. And while these skills are transferable to other similar media, it's, it is usually in association with a book that we learn the skills and associate these skills. But the book is really a collection of data the book is the central piece here. So object-oriented programming is a way of making the data central to our programming. So we still use functions and all the same structural components, but we associate these things with the data and we try to think about the data first. This is why we call functions methods when they are embedded in and part of an object. The thing about object-oriented programming is that uh, it can be even more elegant than procedural programming but only when it's done well. And I've seen lots of examples of it not being done well. I, I like to talk just a bit about coding practices. Coding in school or for a course is actually different than coding in the real world. For one thing, in the real world, everyone borrows code from everyone else. So if you go to an interview and tell them you never Google uh, when coding, uh, but declare that you confidently read the manual and write all your own code from scratch, you probably won't get the job. But in school, you need to think about this a little bit differently. If I just Google someone's code and throw it into my program, I really don't necessarily know what's going on. And I'm going to have a really hard time debugging it. So in the course, you should spend most of your time trying to do the things yourself. That's the only way to figure out how things really work. And there's another reason you should do this. In the real world, when you borrow code, you work it into your program until it's indistinguishable from your own code. And everyone actually codes differently. You cannot do that unless you develop the schools to work out what a bit of code is really doing. And when code doesn't look right, then your professors will check to see if you simply copied it from somewhere else. We call this plagiarism. It doesn't matter that uh, best practices involve copying code and using code from each other. Doing that in class will get you actually expelled from the program. So I want to be clear about that. And for a good reason, you're here to learn how to code so that you can code in any language with confidence. You're not here to learn how to borrow code from websites and claim it as your own. The other best practices I want to mention involve readability and style. Always comment your code. Even if it looks obvious uh, as to what it does, comments help others to know what is going on and helps your professor to see where you went wrong when your code doesn't do what you expected it to do. And this becomes really important in big projects, especially when you're writing functions that are going to be used by other programmers and you have released them into the development environment and they pick it in and they can't figure out what's going on in there your comments should be very explicit and say this takes this uh, these variables it does these functions with them and it returns this it always should say those three things what it takes what it does and what it returns the second thing uh, in addition to commenting is make your code beautiful. You should use consistent indenting. Um, I like to tell my students that it doesn't matter what style you use as long as it's organized and consistent. Some languages count white spaces and return characters as meaningful. So you need to be aware of that for each language. But within those parameters, you can write uh, easily followed, clean, beautiful code. And trust me, it's much easier to debug elegant code than it is to try and figure out a jumble of commands. Make your code a thing of beauty, or at least something that's very well organized.
when you are working on thousands of lines of code, you will appreciate not having to unravel, unravel what we call spaghetti code or just to try and fix a bug. So organized code is Zen. And finally, use naming conventions that make sense. Name your functions and methods after what they do. Name your variables after what they are meant to hold. A good naming convention can help you write code that actually comments itself. So it needs less commenting because you look at it and you can read through the code and it reads almost like a descriptive sentence of what it's doing. So most languages don't care about the length of a variable name or a function name. So you can actually adopt a standard that's consistent with that language. And, and for the computer, it just sees an address. It doesn't care what you call it, but the naming is for us so that we can actually understand what's going on. A computer does only and exactly what we tell it to do, and sometimes we're not very good at communicating to the computer in a way that it can understand. The computer will not guess. It will interpret literally or it will crash if it cannot do that. So when the computer following your instruction does something we did not expect, it is because we have introduced a bug into the program. And there are two main types of bugs that you will encounter. So the first are the easier to track down. We call them syntax errors. Perhaps it is a missing semicolon or a malformed variable declaration. Syntax errors usually, but not always, result in irregularities when compiling. And they are always the product of us uh, not formulating our instructions accurately. But elegant code is really helpful here because syntax errors stick out more where there is consistency to our code. Unfortunately, logical errors do not often result in um, program being unable to compile. They compile just fine but because syntactically they are correct, but logically they contain a, pro a problem. The classic example is working with an array and not starting the offset in the right place. In languages like C, the first element is zero, but in some versions of basic, we used to start at element one. The best way to find logical errors is to trace the variables, which you should know how to do manually as well as from within the IDE. But you will not even know there is a logical error unless you know what answer you should get if the program is working correctly. Much as I dislike math, if I cannot do the math myself, I cannot verify if the code is doing the math correctly. But if I can verify that, then the code can do the math much faster than is humanly possible. So, so that's it. That's a brief introduction to computer programming. It's a half hour long. I hope you found it useful.